Good morning, St. Mary's. It's a beautiful day outside, and I want to welcome you to a beautiful day inside, because today is a really important day. In fact, I think today what we celebrate is one of the most, this is a really strong word, I almost mean this word entirely, it is a criminally underrated celebration in the life of the church. Today we gather to celebrate the ascension. And when we talk about the story of Jesus, we're like, okay, we got Christmas, and we got Good Friday, and we got Resurrection, but the story ends at ascension, and it is the essential end to this story. And today is a wonderful day to celebrate this wonderful end to the story of Jesus here on earth. But as we prepare to worship, I think the story is instructive for us. I always thought the apostles in this story, as you'll hear it in the gospel reading today, I always thought the apostles got a little bit of a short shrift from the angels who show up on that day, okay? Because Jesus is like rising up to heaven. Now, if Jesus is rising to heaven in front of you, what are you going to do? You're going to do exactly what the apostles did. You'll just be like, what, what is happening here? And their eyes go up to heaven, and the angels come up, and we always read it as sort of tisk, tisk, tisk. Don't look up to the heavens. You are, the Spirit's going to come and want you to pay attention to what's going on around you. Okay. It says, do not look up into heaven. But it was Paul later to the Colossians who wrote to the believers, and he said, I want you to set your mind on the things that are above. It says, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. It says, I want you to set your mind on the things that are above. In other words, Paul says, let your eyes drift heavenward. And that is what worship is about. Worship is not about bringing heaven down to earth necessarily. Worship is about discovering that heaven is already here. And in, doing, and in worship, we discover how God is involved in your life and in my life and in our life and how good things are breaking out all over the place. So we come into this space to set our mind on things that are above, and the ascension teaches us this essential truth with a beautiful and wonderful story. And so we are so glad that you are here to celebrate the end of the Jesus story, so to speak, Jesus in flesh on this earth. We come to tell the end of that story and to let our minds be set on things that are above. And so, friends, I invite you to do so. Let your eyes drift heavenward today as we spend the next hour in worship and prayer and singing and all the things we do. To do so, we invite you to quiet your hearts in a moment of silence as we ready ourselves for worship.
worship. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Lord, we worship you alongside the angels in heaven. You deserve the praise of every living thing because you created them and you sustained them. It is by your will we are here to worship. We give you all glory, honor, and power, and crown you Lord of all. Come, let us worship Christ, who is inviting us into life in a new way, a way that transcends death, a way of hope and faith. Let us worship Christ, who sits at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and will, and will be forever. Alleluia. Amen. And now, as we sing the first of several hymns, all of which will be coming from the New Century Hymnal, the Black Hymnals, for those of you that are with us in person today, our first hymn this morning is hymn number 305, Your Servants of God, Your Sovereign Proclaim, followed immediately by hymn number 257, Alleluia, Gracious Jesus, please rise in body and or spirit as we sing together. Hymn 257 in the same hymnal.
Please join me in the prayer of the day. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things, mercifully give us faith to perceive that, according to his promise, he abides with his church on earth, even to the end of the ages. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. The first reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, which can be found on page 118 of your pew Bibles. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when the Lord had come together, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has, taken up from you into he who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Our responsive reading this morning comes from Psalm 93 and can be found in your bulletin. The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. He has established the world. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. More majestic than the thunders of mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea, majestic on high is the Lord. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. The epistle reading this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, and that can be found on page 192 in the Pew Bibles. I have heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put his power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, 
far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the ages to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This ends the epistle reading. And our final reading for this morning comes to us from the gospel according to St. Luke from the 24th chapter. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I have spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are, my, you are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. The Ascension, one of these mystical stories that we're trying to, he just lifted up. Well, let's slow down a little bit because we are here at the end of the story, a story that we began telling all the way. I think this year it was the last week of November is when we started telling this story. And this is what the lectionary does the lectionary, the set of readings. The beginning at the first Sunday of Advent, we tell the story of Jesus for about six months, and then after that, we start telling what it is that we are to do with the rest of the, with the story of Jesus for the next six months. But as we come to the end of the story, we are invited to consider, well, what does all this mean? What does the story of Jesus actually mean? To put it another way, having told this story, what is it that you believe? about Jesus? That is the question for us this morning. What, after telling it all, what do you believe? Well, for me, you could do a whole lot worse in thinking about what we are called to believe as believers than to ask the simple question, well, where is Jesus's body? What should we believe? We'll start with, where is Jesus's actual body? And so consider, walk through this with me for a second. So we began at Christmas. Where is Jesus' body? Jesus' body is in a manger. And we confess that God has become human. That the body of God, the body of Christ, is now made of dirt and spirit just like your body and mine. Jesus has come to be with us. At his baptism, where does the body of Jesus go? Well, it enters the waters of the Jordan. And in doing so, Jesus identifies with us as sinners. He doesn't just say, I'm a better human than you. He says, I will walk alongside this broken humanity. And in doing so, he blesses the waters. Again, where is Jesus' body? Teaches us what we are to believe. Consider as we hear the story of Jesus as he is healing and teaching. Jesus is showing us a new way of, he of being in the world. What does it mean to be human? Jesus is showing us these things. On Good Friday... Jesus' body is bent in prayer in Gethsemane and then is crowned with thorns and, it is, and, he, and his body is hung on a cross. And here Jesus receives all of the violence, all of the brokenness, all of the ugliness of humanity, receives it on himself. And what does the body of Jesus return? Not eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. In receiving all the violence of the world, Jesus offers back pardon and forgiveness. 
On Easter, Jesus' body is no longer in the tomb. Bearing the scars of his suffering, Jesus' body is still scarred, but nevertheless, the body of Jesus lives and eats and forgives and restores. And in all of these things, this is the story of Jesus, that God comes to us, welcomes us, heals us, redeems us to a new way beyond sin and death. And by the way, if you're like, this kind of sounds familiar, what I've just outlined is basically the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed says very little about what Jesus said. It tells us everything about what Jesus' body did. So my question for you on this day, as we come to the end, is where is Jesus' body now? Where is it? Uh, uh, Mark in our column, people have been looking for the body of Jesus on earth for 2,000 years. We never dug up that tomb. It's because I don't believe it's here. But we still kind of wonder, well, Jesus, where are you? And pop theology, sort of a theology that I believe goes sideways, its best answer seems to be, well, Jesus kind of lifted off for outer space, and he's now hanging out with God in like this 2,000 plus year vacation, and we're just kind of waiting for him to come back, like whenever he's done in like whatever the, whatever the space universe equivalent of Cancun is, like when he's done there, he'll come back and take us all to be with him. But if we think this, if that's our best answer to where the body of Jesus is, then this day is ascension. What will lead us is this idea that Jesus is absent from us. That theology leads to an idea of absence, that Jesus is away from us, and we're just kind of holding on for dear life. But that is not the message of today. The message of today is that Jesus' body has not disappeared. Jesus' body has ascended And that is what we celebrate today. And in fact, it is so important that if you look at the Apostles' Creed, it dedicates more, as at least as much, I was going to count the words, I didn't get there, but it dedicates at least as much time to the ascension of Jesus and second coming as it does his crucifixion. This is critical for what it means to be a Christian. Why? The ascension is the coronation of Jesus. In the ascension, Jesus' resurrected body goes up into heaven. And as the author of Ephesians writes, God seated him at his right hand. Sorry, I'm left-handed, so I always do this. Right hand. (laughs) God seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Not only in this age, but in the age to come. And God has put all things under Jesus' feet. You're like, what does it mean to be at the right hand of God, uh, the right hand of anything? To sit at the right hand of, again, left-handed, right hand. To sit at the right hand is to sit in the seat of power. To sit in the seat of ultimate authority in whatever kingdom you're talking about. And so Jesus is not no longer just a king, but Jesus in the ascension finally becomes what we proclaimed him all the way back at Christmas. King of kings and Lord of lords. He has power over those who have power. He is Lord over those who are lords. He is king over anything and anyone who would claim to be a king. Yes, and yes, there are lords in power everywhere, and Jesus trumps them all. All things are now under Jesus' feet. And this reign of Jesus places him far above anything that would make claims on your life or on my life or on our world. Jesus is over it all. And it continues on. Paul writes that he is now head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I guess a little mystical language. It is a little bit, but I want to draw your attention to these words, that Christ fills all in all. I said this a time or two here, but it's one of those things a preacher said I've never forgotten. I remember as a kid, my preacher once said, he says, all means all and that's all all can mean. So when we say that Jesus fills all things, what we mean is that Jesus fills all things. And if Jesus is filling all things, if all things are now under his feet, then in the ascension, what we 
What we proclaim is that Christ is now available, accessible, and present to everyone, everywhere, at any and all times. He fills all space. He fills all time. He fills all in all. And in all of this, the scriptures and the church that has given us these scriptures bear witness that the ascension cracks open the presence of God, that he is all-powerful, and that he is accessible to us all. Thanks be to God. And so often I hear people ask in the midst of our real lives, they say, well, I'm going through a thing. Some of you have asked me this question directly. I'm going through a thing. Somebody I love is going through a thing. I don't know what to do. Where is Christ in all this? And the ascension teaches us that the answer is, where is Christ? Well, he has ascended to the right hand of God, where he exists to pray for us, and he has filled all things, all in all, which means he is present to you right where you're at, which means the answer to where is Christ in the thing that you are going through right now, where is he? Well, he's right in the middle of it. He's right in the middle of it. He's always been there. Because Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Are we at the end of the age yet? As long as you draw breath, the answer is no. Jesus says, I am with you always. And so whatever you are going through, and whatever is pressing down on you, Christ is right there. And they say, preacher, sometimes I don't see it. That doesn't make sense to me. I don't feel God's presence. Well, that's not a failure of God. That's our problem, so to speak. The problem is not that God has not kept his promise. The promise is that we are human. And our ability to discern God's presence is so very limited, broken as we are by sin and death and our concerns. The issue is us. We're human. So we don't always discern the things of God. But that doesn't make any less true that God is present. At all times and in all places, God is with you. And Jesus says, I am with you, not I am watching you. Boy, if I could correct one thing in pop psychology, fixing the ascension would be one thing. The second thing might be this idea that we often believe that that Jesus is just kind of sitting up there watching us, which is not what it says at all. It says that he is with us. And you understand the difference? Watching, and I offer my apologies to my educators who are here. I don't mean to make this analogy sound bad. But watching sounds like a principle. Watching the hallway. Making sure nobody does anything they're not supposed to do, which I never did. And if I did, don't tell anybody. Jesus is not watching us. He is with us. He is walking the hallways of this life with us. And the minutia of your life is made present to Jesus. And since Jesus is at the right hand of God, the minutia, the details of your life are made present to the creator because Jesus sits at the right hand of God. That is a theology that gives life. And so, having been raised to the right hand of God, sitting in the seat of power, far above all other powers, being filled with Christ, now we are becoming the church, which is now the body of Christ. And all of this theology, the good question that theology is always asked is, well, what are we supposed to do? What do we do? Okay, Jesus is present. Hopefully that brings comfort. Hopefully that gives you some sense of God's connection. But what are we to do, church? Are we really just supposed to sit around, sing some songs, pray, and wait for Jesus to return in some way? Let's put it this way. If Jesus' Jesus' body comes down and takes our humanity and lifts that humanity to heaven, the church's responsibility in response is to bring heaven to earth. That is what Jesus is up to. Jesus is empowering his church to bring heaven to earth to earth. Now that we know the full story, that we know God's love and have God's power and we understand God's desire to redeem because Jesus has done that for us, we are to be about that work of working alongside of Jesus to bring heaven to earth. There is no work for a church other than that. And I will die on this hill. There is absolutely nothing else for the church to do but to seek to bring heaven to earth. What does that look like? What does it look like when it looks like all hell is broken loose on, church, on, on the earth sometimes? 
Well, I heard a great illustration, but I'm going to caveat that by saying it's a tiny little bit problematic. I'm going to use the word colony, and our history of colonization isn't, it doesn't show up in a really bright light right now, but go with me for a second. It's not even our colonization. We'll blame it on, we'll blame it on the royals. It's on British colonization. Of course, you know your history that England spread out, sought to be an empire, so they colonized all over the world, including us. And one of the places that they did that most profoundly was in India. And so there were British citizens who went to India to try and seek their fortune to make a living in this new land that they had conquered. And so they get to India, and they look around, and they're like, this don't look like England. I mean, you can imagine, like, you don't have to be, you know, a geography scholar. You don't have to be a world traveler to go. India, not a whole lot like England. But they weren't, but just because they were living in India didn't make them citizens of India. They were still citizens of England. It's like, well, what are we going to do? We got to bring some home here, right? You know what one of the most prevalent things the English love to do every day of their life? They have tea. They have tea. And so all these English colonizers came over and they just decided, you know what, in the middle of our workday, we're having tea, I don't care where we find ourselves. And if you go to India India today, free as it is now of English rule, you know what the people of India still do every single day? They still have their tea every day. There was this little practice that found its way into another land. And it stuck and it changed the culture. To put it a certain kind of way, we are to be a colony of heaven on earth. We are not, friends, citizens of this world. We are in the world, but not of it. And indeed, as we look around, like to say that we're not citizens of this world doesn't make this world a bad place. Certainly, there are many beautiful and wonderful things about this world that we are to wrap our arms around and celebrate and love and preserve and grow. Yes, the scriptures say that God made it all good, including you and me. But the systems of this world, the way the world operates, the way that we think about our shared life, Those are nothing to cling to. Think about it. The polarity that we see in our times, us versus them, and I don't care if that is in our political process or it's in war nation against nation. Our polarity is not the kingdom of heaven. Our polarity is anything but the kingdom of heaven, and it is not to be embraced. It is to be rejected, and we are are called to work towards a different way. Racism. One group against another, one group disempowering another. That is certainly the way the world works, but that is not what God intends for this world. And that, so we are not to embrace that. We are to reject it, and we are to repent, and we are to ask that something else would come in its place, that Jesus' reality of embracing all people would come to bear. We could do this all the way. The presence of nuclear weapons that can destroy all of us multiple, multiple times over. That is not of God. War is not of God. The economic disparity we see where this many people have this much of the wealth so that there are still poor in our country and all over the world. None of that is the way of God. None of these are the kingdom of God. They are to be rejected because we're about bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. In other words, the church is to be, a, is to be heaven's tea time, a little piece of the kingdom hidden away in the corners of the earth. So how do we do that? It starts not with our work. And if the church has, needs to learn one lesson in this era, it is that we constant, we're like, all right, Jesus tells us to do a thing, and so we try to go do a thing. We are always doing, and we will get to doing, but our work begins in prayer. Our most fundamental prayer is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In other words, our most fundamental cry to God is to look to heaven, to the kingdom that Jesus is head of, and to say, how would heaven handle this? And to see that happen on the earth. How would heaven handle this? You see, friends, it is only in prayer 
And what I would call, it's only in contemplative prayer do we become aware and awake to the heaven that is already in us. We are citizens of the kingdom. Heaven is already in us. We are called to go live that. And it is only in contemplative prayer do we shed the other influences in our lives to ask the question, how would heaven handle this? It's only in quiet and in peace do we say, I feel other voices calling me to something different, but the kingdom of heaven says, here is who I am to be. Prayer helps us sort that out. And out of all that prayer, out of that fixing our minds on the things that are above, then we get to work. How do we do that work? Well, if our theology is where is Jesus' body, then our work must ask the question, well, where are our bodies? Where do we put our bodies? If we are citizens of heaven, then wherever we are is where heaven is working. Wherever you are is where heaven is working. So what are your bodies doing? Are our bodies... Sometimes, sometimes literally, sometimes not so literally, are our bodies kneeling in prayer and standing in worship. This is the work of the kingdom of heaven. Are our bodies close to other bodies, building relationships, showing love, getting to know one another, not just across the computer screen, but in real, actual, physical reality? Or our bodies speaking words of comfort and peace, sometimes speaking words of justice and saying things are not as they should be, but are we speaking the words of God? Are our bodies living into rhythms of work and rest so that we re- reject the destructive call of the kingdoms of this world to believe that our worth is only in our production? Are our bodies holding the hands of others, laughing with others, crying with others? This is how we put our bodies in in the path and in the way and in the kingdom of Jesus so that heaven might break forth where we are. Christ's body is at the right hand of God to raise us to God, so our bodies are to be put at the service of others to raise them to the knowledge and the inbreaking of God. And that, friends, is how the powers and principalities of this world are defeated and Christ's reign is revealed. In love, intangible, embodied, redemptive love, we participate with Christ in revealing Christ's salvation for the whole world, which has already been accomplished. Thy kingdom come, and the rest of the powers and principalities of this world will all pass away. They'll gripe about it while they do it. They'll they'll twist, and they'll groan, and they'll scream, but they already know their defeat is at hand. And in his place, we will discover the world that Jesus is redeeming, the beautiful world, the eternal world that Christ came to bring right now, right here. And so in this way, today is a day for celebration. Jesus is Lord, friends, and there is no, no, nothing more central than that. Jesus Christ is Lord. And as Jesus said to his apostles, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Think differently. And my prayer for you, as we live out this ascension into Pentecost next week and in the weeks that are to come, as we figure out what it looks to live out this kingdom, my prayer for you is the same as Paul's prayer was for his hearers. Today we read out of the early part of Ephesians. I'd like to read you the prayer that happens in the backside of Ephesians, a prayer that is informed by the ascension of Jesus and his place in our lives. Paul writes, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. He puts his body into it. From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how high and wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we think or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.
And so if at Good Friday we reveled in the weakness and the lowliness of Jesus, we can put alongside of it at the ascension the power and the strength of Jesus. These things are not opposites. They are, they are exactly the picture of the kingdom of God. And so we celebrate the power and the glory of Jesus as we sing hymn number 304 in the New Century Hymnal. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Please stand as we celebrate our King. So friends, we invite you to remain standing as together we proclaim our faith in its fullness, having told the story of Jesus, having told what he has done for us and what he is calling us to, let us proclaim that in the words of our ancestors, the believers who have gone before us, as together we confess the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen indeed. Thank you very much. Please be seated. <clears throat> and it is the story of the ascension that informs so much of sort of how I think about prayer. Because when I come to prayer, like in and of myself, I'm just like, eh. You know, and I've heard it from so many of you, like, are my needs that big of a deal? Like, no. And I've had so many people say to me, don't pray for me. God's got bigger things to think about. Huh? Jesus fills all in all, and the tiny details of our life are present to Jesus who sits at the right hand of the Father. There is nothing that is too small for our Savior. And that is why with such boldness the church has prayed. We have such boldness to say, God, I want you in the midst of these problems. And Jesus says, I am already there. Look for me. And in looking for me, see what I am doing in the lives of those who need your prayers. And so with great boldness, we offer up our prayers for those who find their way onto our prayer list this day. 
And a couple of, up, uh, one update, um, we've been praying for Caitlin Carr, um, who was diagnosed uh, with breast cancer at 37 weeks pregnant. Uh, she was induced on April 27th, um, and as things have moved forward, um, she is scheduled now to get a double mastectomy and chemotherapy. Um, and so we pray for that journey, but on top of that, you can imagine that all of that in the midst of caring for a newborn infant uh, just makes that journey a tremendously difficult one. And so please continue to be in prayer for Caitlin. We are asked to pray this morning for our brother, uh, Larry Miller, who's going in for a heart catheterization tomorrow. And so please keep Larry in your prayers. And Larry, all our best to you. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to a clear road ahead for you. And then also is asked to pray for the family of Dick Baker. Um, <clears throat> uh, Dick is the husband of Doug's sister, Brenda Baker, um, who passed away on Saturday morning. And so um, our condolences to your family. And we certainly offer up our prayers there as well. And so with these in mind, let us go before our Lord in prayer. Our Lord and our God, finally, fully, with conviction, we can cry out, Lord, you indeed are Savior of all. And because of that, we can live into that reality without fear, without concern. Yes, things are going to be screaming at us. But here in these places that we call the church, these little gatherings where we simply seek to understand you and where you're headed in the world, we are a tiny little piece of heaven. And Lord, we desire here at St. Mary's to be that. We want to be an ex a tiny experience of heaven in a world that constantly screams otherwise. And so Lord, in light of the ascension, we offer up our prayers and ask, oh God, that you would bless us. Help us to be that kind of place, a place where love and justice and mercy and forgiveness and service are always happening here in ways large and small. So God, we ask that this ascension story wouldn't be the story of your absence, but rather it would be the story of your presence in powerful, powerful ways. And so God, in light of that, we offer up our prayers, believing in that power to do good work in our lives. And so we lift up our friends for whom we pray for this day. And we all continue to pray for Caitlin Carr. And Lord, we say thank you for uh, for her journey and that she has a path forward, Lord. We mourn the double mastectomy and chemotherapy. We know that'll be incredibly difficult. But nevertheless, we thank you for how far she's come. And so we pray for Caitlin and we pray for her daughter. And we ask, oh God, that you would be present to them and with all who love them, would, they, would you allow your care and comfort to be present there? Lord, we pray for our brother Larry as he prepares for a heart catheterization tomorrow, Lord. And we pray for, we pray for ease of procedure and we pray for good results. Lord, would you certainly show what's going on and provide a way forward for Larry. <clears throat> and Lord, we pray for the family of Dick Barber who passed away on Saturday morning. And Lord, as always, we mourn the passing of any of your children. But we also celebrate the goodness that was in their lives. And so we pray for the Baker family as they mourn his passing. And Lord, may they discover your comforting presence there. And with all of this, Lord God, we also bring our own burdens to bear. Prayers for ourselves prayers for those whom we love, prayers for our world that are too big for us. And so hear us as we pray in the silence of our hearts, Lord, knowing that our prayers rise all the way to the throne of God. All these things we pray, not in our strength, but in the strength of the one who joined himself to us in our humanity, who died for our sins, who resurrected to defeat death, and has ascended to be Lord of all. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And in light of the ascension, this Lord's Prayer takes on a different tone, does it not? Yes, it is a prayer of lowliness. It is our prayer. It is the prayer of those who walk this earth. It is also the prayer of the one who is King of kings and Lord of lords. And so let us pray it in that spirit today, as together we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And friends, one of the ways that we become this heaven's tea time, a little bit of heaven on earth, is by our service in the world. We're so excited that we get to continue to be a part of a little piece of this with our friends in South Carroll as we continue to celebrate and, uh, and work towards uh, the Canley Cup. Um, and I have a couple stories to share about that, but we did want to get you excited. And I need you to know that I was very excited. It's the first time in my life that I got to wear a hockey jersey in the sanctuary. I'm very excited about this. But we wanted to sort of give you an update on where it's at and invite your further participation as we continue to serve our neighbors who are in need. And so, friends, I invite you to watch the Canley Cup. Hey, hockey fans, help St. Mary's take home the Canley Cup in our toiletries, paper goods, and cleaning supplies competition. Take it from a hockey player. It takes a great team to win. Great scoring, great defense, great goaltending, and a team-first mindset. Always playing hard for your line mates. Communities are the same. It takes everyone working together for our communities to thrive. Over the last few years, more and more families need the support of local services to make ends meet. And while we're cheering on our teams in the Stanley Cup playoffs, we're ready to rock the red to help our neighbors in need. Canley Cup is a shared vision between congregations in the northern and southern ends of Carroll County to come together and do everything we can to help those who need assistance. But we couldn't help turn it into a friendly competition. And our donations throughout the month of May will benefit Shepherd Staff Blessings Closet in Westminster, which provides free toiletries, paper products, and cleaning supplies to anyone in need. While we know everyone wins when we're helping our neighbors, the team with the most Blessing Closet items collected will take home the Canley Cup. You can support Canley Cup by making your donations of toiletries, cleaning supplies, and paper products like toilet paper, paper towels, and tissues at St. Mary's United Church of Christ, or at Brewer's Market. And if shopping isn't your best way to contribute, we will accept monetary donations. You can do that online or by making out a check to St. Mary's. And in the memo line, please note Canley Cup. Thank you for helping us score a goal for our neighbors. Boy, I gotta tell you what, these gloves really smell bad. <laughs> And I happen to have the Canley Cup. I need you to understand, all right, is all I can do to not raise it over my head, okay? But we are in a place of worship. I am not going to do that. But I did want to offer two stories and to say thank you so much already for your, um, for your support of this. And uh, I am told that due to your monetary donations, Bonnie's uh, vehicle right now is filled with 180 items that we were able to purchase with your monetary donations. She said, I am not carrying them all, the, all inside the church. I said, that's totally fine. I get it. Um, she said, if you want to go out and see them, if you need visual evidence of that, you can see her after church. And she'll be happy to show that to you. And the other thing I wanted you to know is that I uh, had a chance to play some hockey this week. And my hockey guys all said, hey, we'll take half the money we raise from playing hockey because we pay a couple bucks to play. He said, we will donate that towards what you guys are doing down at St. Mary's, which means for one of the first times in my life, I can legitimately say I was playing hockey for Jesus, okay, which is very exciting, very exciting. But uh, want to invite you to continue to contribute towards that. If you have any questions, you can see me. Sabrina is really the, the, uh, the mastermind behind this. You can talk to Sabrina as well. But please continue to give, whether it's monetary, donations, or script cards. Um, all of that will go towards supporting Canley Cup. But at this time, we're going to continue with the gifts that you have given today. And we invite you to bring, we invite you to help us celebrate as we are a little piece of heaven, giving of what we have, that Jesus might take it and multiply it like loaves and fishes. We bring our offering forward. Please hear us say thank you for the work that you do to support this congregation and our work. And would you please join us in blessing it as we stand together.
In this world, kingdom living. In our mouths, kingdom praises. In our hearts, kingdom goals. In our hands, kingdom gifts. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And so as we prepare to depart from this ascension celebration, we go knowing that wherever we go, Jesus is already in charge. And for this, we give thanks. We invite you to sing hymn number 300 in the New Century Hymnal, Jesus Shall Reign. Go with this knowledge. Christ is at the right hand of God. Christ fills all things. Christ is present with us here and now. So as you go forth into the coming week, may God open your mind to his presence so that you may truly know him. May he open the eyes of your heart so that you can experience the hope he offers to all who follow him. And may you come to understand the full extent of God's power at work in your life, the very same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of God. We go to serve our Lord in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated for a couple of announcements. I want to begin saying the altar flowers are given to the glory of God and in memory of Diane and Steve Zentgraf. And to those who love Diane and Steve, we say thank you so very much. And we certainly pray um, that even as you miss them, that you would know God's peace and comfort. Thank you so much for allowing them, us to honor them today. 
And our tech sponsorship for today is in honor of Josh Brown's birthday. Josh, welcome back. Good to see you. Uh, and his birthday is on May the 24th. I love mom, dad, Andy, and Ryan. I got to tell you, the first time I read that, I didn't see Andy's name. I'm like, uh-oh, those boys are at each other. But then I did. So Andy says happy birthday too. Josh, great to see you and happy birthday. A couple of deadlines. A script deadline is today. Um, and just as an FYI, we said you can use script to support Canley Cup. If you're doing that, please be sure to send Emily a note with that information so she knows how to divide them out. Um, but a script deadline is today, so please jump on that. Um, June newsletter submission deadline is Wednesday, May the 24th. So please get all of your stuff to Sabrina. Um, and then also come at, so two things coming up. First of all, next Sunday, just a heads up, Next Sunday is our celebration of Pentecost, but this year is going to be a really special Pentecost as we celebrate the confirmation of six of our young men and women. Um, so next Sunday, uh, just to tell you, is going to be a beautiful service. There's going to be a lot to celebrate. Just as a heads up, it will not be done in an hour. I'm just telling you that right now, okay? Just plan, please plan accordingly. It's Memorial Day weekend, and if you're here, you're not going anywhere. I'm kidding, but anyway, just as a heads up, next week... It's going to be a wonderful service, and we really do invite you to come and to celebrate the journey that six of our young men and women have been on. And then as we're speaking of our young men and women, uh, Sunday, June the 18th, we are very excited to celebrate our graduate and student recognition. Um, we want to know who in your life needs celebrating, and so please check your emails um, for information to get that out over to the office. And if you're like, I'm not sure about email, Sabrina's here. You can catch up with Sabrina or with me as well. We just want to get the information so that we can make sure they are a part of that. And we have some surprises we want to twist in with that, so please make sure you talk to us. Don't just assume that we kind of know. Um, and I'm going, oh, yes, there is one more. I'm coming to it, Jane. Um, also, the Homewood at Plum Creek Auxiliary is hosting their tea event, It's Tea Time. It's being sell, uh, hosted on Tuesday, July the 18th at 12.30 p.m. The cost is $30, and if Jane has told me once, she's told me multiple times, seating is very, very limited. It's a very special event, but if you want tickets, do not wait. Um, please see Jane today as soon as possible. So today would be as soon as possible. Please see Jane about that. And then also there will be a brief choir rehearsal in the music room following our service today. And so if you're singing in the choir, um, we invite you to head back to the room. And then one last thing is that um, I have a slight meeting. I'm meeting with the family immediately after church, so I will hang out there for about 10 seconds. And then peace out. If you want to see me, I'll be in the office. Um, please forgive me, but I want to make sure I honor that appointment. So I'm not leaving you, just going off to do my work. And so friends, wherever you go, Christ reigns. Even in the places where it feels terrible, in the places where it feels wonderful, even when you look around, you can't see. Christ reigns. And in that, this week, may you know peace and good. <clears throat> Thank you.